I'm updating a blog on the topic of auditor training. And Matthew Walker is one of the people on our team that uh, does quite a bit of auditing himself. And he suggested, great idea. Show people where in the ISO 19011 standard, you can find references to training for auditors. There's a lot of places you can find it. So I'm actually have up on the screen here, uh, I'm sharing my uh, copy of the ISO 1911 uh, standard uh, for 2018, as well as my own video here. And I typed in the word training. And if you just scan ahead at the very beginning of the document, even before you get into the body of the standard, it says this guidance document could be used for the purpose of self-declaration and can be useful to organizations involved in auditor training and personnel certification. So if you are doing self-training yourself and you want to say, uh, this is how I learned how to become an auditor. This could be one of the documents you use. If you are a, um, an audit program manager and you're trying to train uh, team members and lead auditors on your team, this is how you could do that. You could use this document as your reference. And if you are a notified body or other training certification organization, this would be the document you would turn to this is how we're supposed to conduct audits because it's an internationally recognized standard on how to do auditing. The next links, and, the, and there are 16. Uh, this next little section here, it says, and I'm gonna shrink my video a little bit so you can see it better. So this next item says, um, the audit team can include auditors in training. So a lot of times people say, no, 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 this person isn't qualified. If there is a lead auditor on the team that is qualified, then you can have other team members on the audit that are not fully trained. They're still in training as long as the lead auditor is supervising them, gives them guidance, and takes, um, takes responsibility for the work that they perform. So that person should be looking at their audit agenda, should be looking at what their um, sampling plan was, should be looking at their audit notes, their audit report, should maybe even observe them doing some audit, depending on what stage of their training they're at. So that would be a useful thing for you to think about if you're um, thinking about, I need more people to conduct this audit, you can always bring in some other people for training and they can still participate in the audit and do some of the work, but you just have to have somebody supervising them. Um, one of the things that, that they have in here are making sure you have auditors with the right training. So do they have training on the standards that they're going to be auditing to as audit criteria? These are usually the most common thing that we're looking for. But it could be other things as well. Maybe just general familiarity with things like software, um, biocompatibility, sterilization. If you don't know anything about sterilization, how are you going to go audit a sterilization contract uh, um, contract sterilizer that's doing your, uh, let's say, E-beam or gamma or ethylene oxide sterilization? Next, we had auditors in training. So this is going back to that earlier statement. Auditors in training may be included in the team, but should participate under the direction and guidance of an auditor. So when you're assigning work to the team, you can assign it to auditors in training as well as auditors. You define the different responsibilities for the different people on the team. You can even have technical experts that have no auditor training, but sometimes you need those people. Uh, if you're having a person come on board and review a technical file and it has a lot of software in it, you might need somebody that has the ability to review that code, do a code review and see, hey, is this... Is this going to be adequate or not? Um, there's a whole entire section, section seven of the standard says competence and evaluation of auditors. So this is the key section you want to go to, section seven, and the different subsections of that where we're talking about what are the requirements for competency and how do you evaluate the competency of auditors. And they say here, what you might consider is education, work experience, auditor training, and audit experience. All of those would be um, aspects that you would evaluate 
a competency of auditors by. In this section, um, it looks like 7.1, a little bit further down, determine the need for improved competency or additional training required for auditors. So if you're going to have them uh, expand their roles and responsibilities to new areas, you might have to do training before you do that. Um, under the category of generic competence of the audit team leader, that person should also be capable of providing direction guidance to auditors and training. It's a lot different for a lead auditor to manage themselves than it is to manage an audit team. And the less experienced that team is, the harder that job is. Um, in order to achieve auditor com competence, one of the things you wanna look for is successfully completing your training. Another thing is uh, what kind of a additional formal training might be required or education specific to the field that you're in, or um, it might even be um, not specific to auditing, but might be in another area. Like you might send somebody out for formal training on sterilization validation before they're gonna go audit contract sterilizers. We're uh, getting close to the end of this section. So this next one here, successful completion of a training course, it depends on the type of the course. So sometimes it's an exam, did you get a passing score? Sometimes it's a written essay and an expert is evaluating that against the standard. Sometimes it's a verbal um, question and answer. So you ask verbal questions, the person has to articulate it. Sometimes it's observation of the person. So there's lots of different types of ways to evaluate whether the person has successfully completed their training. Uh, two other areas down here at the bottom of this page. One of them is establishing auditor evaluation criteria. So it, it depends on what you're trying to evaluate, but you might have criteria be the number of hours they've audited, the number of audits they've performed, um, how many uh, supplier audits, uh, what standards they've audited to, whether they've led a team or versus being a team member, actually writing up the report. There's a lot of different ways you could evaluate their um, whether they are have completed their auditor training yet or not. And a lot of companies will come up with a very arbitrary system. Like they've completed three audits being observed by somebody else. They're done. And I, in this article that I just am in the process of reposting and, um, and making revisions to, I say, you know, that's sort of like, saying to a brand new 16, 16 year old driver in training, well, I'm gonna watch you drive the car three times. And if you do a good job, don't hit anything, then you get your license. That's not enough. So if you look at what the state of Vermont requires, they want you to have 40 hours of training observed by somebody else. And that person has to sign a log book. So the expectation for somebody that's gonna be doing quality auditing for a company should be higher than we saw you do it three times, but how much more that really depends on their prior experience and how much they, how much training that they've had. Um, there was a, another section here, 7.3, establishing auditor evaluation criteria. There's selecting appropriate auditor evaluation method. So there you, like I said before, you could have them write something, you could have them take a multiple choice exam, you could observe them. There are a lot of ways to evaluate their, their uh, competency. And um, in 7.6, we get into uh, maintaining and improving auditor competency. So just because I was trained as an auditor and I was uh, went through a formal certification process doesn't mean I stopped doing audits. Every year I say, I got to do at least some audits so I maintain my skills. But in addition, I'm always trying to come up with, you know, it's been a little while since I've done some training on auditing. I should train some more people, get raise their level, and that forces me to raise my level of skill as well. And I try to continue to do a better job and always bring something new to the client that I'm doing audits for. So I'm adding value, not just giving them the same thing that they've seen before. I hope that gives you a good
background of what's in these standards. Uh, I think I've covered all the sections. Um, yeah, we're back to the beginning of the standard now. So I covered all the places, the 16 places in this standard where they cover training for auditors. But if you're looking for developing a training program, this is the document to use and gives you a lot of uh, insight on how you can evaluate the training and document your training. Have a great day. Bye-bye.